Welcome to the future we need and how to get it. Tonight we take on the toughest yet of our challenges to change the game itself, to shape the very systems that so powerfully shape us. The ones rigged against us, the ones that do not only get in the way of our best selves, but drive us to our worst selves. A world of goaded greed awash in weapons, a world in which our very survival economically seems absolutely to require our very suicide ecologically. God, how crazy can it get? Over the past five shows, we've seen how many promising solutions are emerging worldwide, a process at once inspiring and frustrating. The truth is that the only thing harder to deal with than not having answers urgently needed is to find that there are good answers just within reach, but that they're not being used. They're not even being talked about mostly. What can we do? And especially, what can we do knowing that we're up against maybe the most powerful system of worldwide control ever known? One subtler for sure, and operating far more on seduction than force in most places, but all the more powerful maybe for just that reason. When they, the powers that be, seem to own the money, the media, the markets, and the very mechanisms of government, how can we, the people, the ordinary folks, ever hope to prevail? In the end, it just seems not to matter that we can find or invent even the best of solutions if we cannot put these solutions to work. Okay, so tonight in this show, Change the Game, and our final show next month, What We Can Do, we take on this challenge. Here's my own bottom line. When I started this series, it was an act of faith. I knew enough to put out there that the solutions we need exist and that we're just plain morally obligated not to give up and to do all we can to find answers or create them and get them into the system. But at the same time, I was anything but convinced that we have the power we need. I was carrying the same nagging fear we all have that no matter the urgency and no matter the answers, we'd still be defeated by all the great powers aligned against us and even by our own inadequacies of which there are so many. But six months and six shows and a whole lot more beating of the bushes later, I am ironically vastly more confident than I ever thought to be. I'm now convinced we actually can defeat the powers that be or transform them and can bring them into being systems that work a whole lot better for everyone than what we have now and to do it just in time. I don't mean that it's a slam dunk, farthest thing from it, nor am I saying we'll get it all right of course not. Not only are we all too human, but we are up against challenges and opportunities that are absolutely brand new to our species. We're bound to make a whole string of mistakes figuring out how to do what's needed. But that is so not to say that it is beyond our reach, just that it's tough. So this is all I am saying, what the past six months has convinced me of. What we need to do is now clear enough and doable enough and has enough phenomenally competent people already well into it to give us a roadmap we can use and the chance we need. Next month, we'll sketch out at least briefly some of what we can do to make the most of that potential. Tonight, we'll look at a little of what I've found so far that does as I see it, point us in the right direction. To get to the future we need, we have to name it to know what it is and that it is possible, to believe in it. That's our first step. Here are two of the several places in the world where a sustained and rigorous effort to do just that is well underway. The first is the Next Systems Project. Pulled together by Gar Alperovitz, this effort involves some 700 of America's thought leaders, including, for example, Robert Reich and Naomi Klein, with carefully considered contributions from people all over America who are deeply engaged in a dialogue about what seem to be the best things emerging here and abroad. Together they are exploring just what kind of political economy it is that we need. The menu of choices with labels of isms familiar to us all has long been laid out and endlessly argued about. Democracy, republic, oligarchy, capitalism, socialism, communism, a market system, dictatorship, or as we will discuss next month, the Nordic model. Their intention in these conversations is not to debate old labels or stale or divisive ideologies, 
but just to figure out together what are the emerging system solutions that show the greatest promise. For the record, my own preferred ism is pragmatism. Picture in the early 1980s when he was moving China from communism into capitalism with Chinese characteristics, as it came to be called. Deng Xiaoping was criticized by old school Maoists. Famously, he retorted, I don't care if the cat is a black cat or a white cat as long as it catches mice. In this effort to get past ideologies and discover working systems, I have just found another great resource. It is a brand new free online course from MIT taught by Otto Scharmer, founder of Theory U, called Transforming Capitalism, that started in April of 2018. Here is what Otto has to say in inviting people to follow this course. When the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, something happened that almost no one thought was possible. Even the activists who played a key role in bringing it down didn't really believe it could happen. That's exactly how many of us experience our relationship to capitalism today, that the design and structure of capitalism is beyond our sphere of influence. But what if we are approaching the same moment today? What if the change that feels almost impossible is actually much closer than anyone can imagine? We believe that the future is already here. It's embodied in many local and regional initiatives, some of which you may be already part of. Yet why are all the great initiatives not changing capitalism as we know it? Because we don't have a mechanism that allows the emerging movement to become aware of itself. We do not have a mechanism that does for the new economy what the current media structures do for the old economy, amplifying it. The collapse of the Berlin Wall seemed impossible even up until the moment it actually happened. The transformation of capitalism seems equally impossible to imagine and even harder to bring about. Yet we believe that this great transformation, the most important of our generation, is already happening around us and through us. Join us in transforming capitalism from ecosystem to ecosystem economies, or as others have put it, from extraction to restoration. Before we leave the Transforming Capitalism course, though, I want to go back to this slide where Otto asks, just why is it that with all the potent solutions showing up world round, we still do not even see, let alone believe, that capitalism can actually be transformed? Because, he answers, we don't have a mechanism that allows the emerging movement to become aware of itself yeah. and thus to amplify itself. We don't know our own story. That's the very reason for this series, to amplify the truth of what is actually happening and why it matters and what we can do to help it happen. So far, we have looked at two efforts to imagine and name the systems we seek. But now I want to turn to a different systems question. How do we understand and depict the systems we have in the real world? Here's a video by Beth Sawin of MIT it's the best short video I've so far found on such systems. In this video, I'll offer you two things. First, I'll explain what we mean by the word system when we say systems thinking or a systems approach. And second, I'll share with you an important idea from systems thinking, one that you can apply and test right away in your own work. This is the idea that good people can make harmful decisions if the systems within which they're making those decisions are poorly designed. And therefore, that one of the best ways to try to improve the world is to improve the systems that we all live and work within. So let's start with the definition of a system. System may be a word that you've heard quite a lot lately, maybe used in different ways. In the climate leader, we define the word system very specifically. A system is a set of elements whose interconnections determine their behavior. This collection of circles is not a system. It has elements, but they aren't particularly interconnected. This flower, on the other hand, is definitely a system. It's composed of parts or elements, and the way the elements interact determines the behavior of the whole system. 
The roots supply the leaves with water and nutrients. The arrangement of the petals in the flower attracts pollinators, and so on. Of course, the flower is also an element in a bigger system that contains soil and other plants, sun and wind and rain. A forest is a system and so is a sports team. A neighborhood, a company, your liver, those are all systems. A parliament or a political movement, those are systems too. Any set of elements whose interconnections determine their behavior is a system. Now, what do I mean by the interconnections determining the behavior? That should become more clear if we talk about a concrete, specific example. Imagine there's a CEO of an energy company who needs to decide whether or not that company should construct a new coal-fired power plant. Let's think about some of the elements that might influence that decision maker. That person's individual concern about climate change might influence the decision, and different individuals playing the role of CEO might have different levels of concern. But no matter what the individual's beliefs, there are a set of pressures that would apply to most people holding that role. There's how strongly shareholders desire the company to be profitable, and there's the expected profitability of a new coal-fired power plant compared to other types of electricity generation. That profitability in turn depends on a whole set of factors, including whether there's a price for carbon pollution and how high that price is, what the costs of other sources of energy are, and the cost to meet other standards, like air quality standards. You might think of other influences as well. A CEO who is personally concerned about climate change might very well be reluctant to invest in a coal-fired power plant. But if all of the incentives of the system remain the same, if the shareholders are demanding a high return on investment, if carbon pollution is free, if renewable energy is much more expensive than fossil energy, then do you think a CEO who wanted to maintain his or her position would be able to decide against a coal-fired power plant if it was the most profitable alternative? Maybe. Maybe a remarkable individual could do just that. But then what would happen? How long would that individual keep shareholder confidence? How long until a new leader would be recruited, one who would be more focused on profits and less focused on climate? This line of thinking leads to an important question that you should apply to your own work. Would a new decision maker placed in the same system make a different decision? If you find yourself facing a system that's not functioning in the way you'd like to see, whether that system is the UN climate negotiations or your team of six at your workplace, we'd encourage you to take your frustration and your desire for change and apply it not to blaming the decision maker stuck within a poorly functioning system, but instead to asking yourself how that system could be changed. If we take our example of the energy company CEO, replacing one CEO with another individual might not lead to radical change. But what if we could change the taxes, the regulations, the incentives, the policies influencing those decision makers? Then we might see real differences. And in fact, around the world, people are organizing themselves to change the mixture of incentives and pressures that influence decisions about where our energy comes from. In the U.S., the Obama administration is putting tougher controls on the performance standard for coal-fired power plants. Around the world, climate advocates are pressuring governments to adopt carbon prices. Others are working to reduce the cost of renewable energy via research and development or via government subsidies for clean energy. And new business models are being developed that allow business decision-making to take into account goals other than profit. Each of these strategies, if successful, has a chance to change the balance of pressures and incentives in ways that could lead to different outcomes. Systems rarely change by themselves. They change because people like you and me work together, strategize, collaborate, push, pull, coax, and sometimes force systems into new behaviors. Choosing to focus more on the system and less on the players does not mean sitting passively back and waiting for systems to change themselves. Sometimes it means being brave, say when advocating for an unpopular policy. Sometimes it means being persuasive, say when coaxing someone to try a new technology or the subway instead of a car. Sometimes it means leading by example. Sometimes it means being willing to commit civil disobedience. Sometimes it means showing up with a spreadsheet full of cost-benefit calculations. Changing systems is unlikely to be easy. If it was easy to change a system for the better, it probably would have already been changed. But if you persevere, if you continue to ask yourself, how do the pressures and incentives in this system give rise to its behavior, then I think that you'll find new strategies, new possibilities, and new avenues for change.
Note that in bed, the curved arrows are not just a cool way to show relationships in this video, but are in fact what are technically called causal loop diagrams, used to diagram the dynamics of complex adaptive systems, that is, living systems. And here's a living example of these loops in use to diagram a complex adaptive system, the interstate energy system of six states in the upper Midwest in 2003. At that time, a small group of people from those six states and 24 foundations and, with, and NG, NGOs came together to use a systems approach to see if they could do something substantial about the states of the upper Midwest, which had been contributing vastly disproportionate amounts of carbon to the atmosphere. They were determined to work across the usual divides and figure out where they could best intervene to make a real difference. They committed what ended up to being a year and a half seeking to understand all the factors involved in their interstate energy system as a whole. That, as it turned out, laid the foundation for what some have termed the most substantial achievements yet made in climate action in the U.S. Scott Spann, their consultant, interviewed each participant individually, and using the causal loop diagrams we just saw in Beth Sawin's video, depicted how each of the individuals saw the dynamics of the energy system from their own perspective. Then he combined these individual maps into group maps that showed how different sectors saw the system. And then finally, he brought all these maps into one map that captured the shared understanding as to the realities they were all dealing with. With this as their foundation, as well as all the relationships they'd personally built along the way, they became able at last to name their big, hairy, audacious goal to make the Midwest a leader in climate stability by reducing greenhouse gas emissions there by 80% by 2030. And with that, they could also target in the system precisely the four leverage points they needed to focus on in separate efforts, but, and this was the critical factor as it turned out, all at the same time in parallel. And the result in their first lever, clean up the coal, retire old coal plants, stop new ones, 150 coal plants are now slated for retirement. More than 30 new coal plants that had been scheduled were stopped no new ones will be built. They reduced overall coal use by 6%. The Midwest Governors Association has adopted the toughest cap and trade regulations in the USA. They increased energy efficiency with innovation, cooperation, regulation. They financed energy efficiency. They developed an energy efficiency portfolio standards in six of the Midwest states. They have new transportation decreasing requirements in three of the states. They develop new energy sources, state renewable energy standards in five of the states, and wind, bioenergy, solar, and other renewables, creating new jobs across the region. This group, the REAMP Network, committed to a 40-year effort and now encompasses eight states and some 164 organizations. Its approach to systems change, now called collective impact, one of, the, one of seeking a shared and accurate understanding of system dynamics, all factors considered, while building a deeply interconnected network of change agents across sectors, is perhaps the leading model today of how to achieve change, a model we've only started to learn how to use. Another such effort now happening in Santa Cruz and one I'm particularly interested in supporting is the work of Les Leopold. You may remember we featured him on the fourth show, explaining in some painful detail just where the rules of our system are now so broken that they are permitting massive wrongdoing by corporate managers and driving runaway inequality, as he calls it in his book. Les has argued that the only way to create the national movement that we need to actually wrest our country back from the money oligarchy that it has taken us over is to make sure that the real story gets out to everyone. To that end, he's starting the reversing runaway inequality campaign to train thousands of people to tell the story and use it to organize the citizen actions that we can 
used to force the needed changes. On that note, I'm so happy to tell you the second part of our program, taped separately, will feature the Northern California director of the Reversing Runaway Inequality Campaign, Eve Major. She will discuss the campaign and its relationship to the Poor People's Campaign as well. Let me wrap up our show tonight by reminding you of this key point made long ago by Buckminster Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. As we think about creating a livable future, then one where democracy really works, here's the best example I've yet seen of what Bucky is talking about, showing up in Taiwan. I'll let Audrey Tang tell you all about it in this video. For the only peaceful transition in Taiwan's political history, uh, because the previous elections we see like 49%, 50%. We see people unfriending each other after election results. We see a lot of people going to the streets, riots even, in the previous elections, but not this one. Uh, last January, when the ballot opens, uh, Dr. Tsai won by a landslide, but the previous prime minister is an independent. He's Simon Zhang, uh, previously director of engineering at Google, uh, Taiwan's first supercomputer maker, uh, and he's independent. He doesn't have any parties. And the new prime minister, the one that's still now uh, the prime minister for a year now, uh, Lin Quan, is also independent. So the two independent prime ministers did something that was unthinkable in Taiwan's uh, history is that the transition is public. Simon asked all the ministries to publish their checkpoint documents, open data, everything, and upload it to the public internet for the next cabinet to download as the transition team. And I didn't know I would become part of the cabinet a few months after it assembled, but I still look at exactly the same documents so that I can learn what's going on with the island. And so this kind of transparent handoff is born out of Simon John's idea that all the ICT systems produced in Taiwan under one million US dollars must be made open data by default. And that put Taiwan into the top spot in the global open data index for two years running now. Now take that with a grain of salt because it, it doesn't measure the impact or anything, but the societal, the cultural impact, I think, is much more important. So Dr. Tsai Ing-wen said in her inauguration speech that we know before in Taiwan, democracy was about a showdown between two different values, but now it must become a conversation with diverse values. But how did we get there to this post-party system? It, we got there like four years ago, if you pull a random person on the street in Taiwan and say, we're going to move into a cabinet where not only the prime minister is independent, but there's more independent cabinet members than any members of any party in the cabinet. They're like, you're crazy. But, but this happened because of the Occupy back in 2014. Back in the time, the Sunflower Movement uh, students occupied the parliament because the MPs refused to deliberate a trade service agreement with Beijing because they think constitutionally Beijing is part of Taiwan or something like that. But in any case, they refused to deliberate on the agreement. So the occupiers, far from protesting, did a demonstration in the demo scene sense, meaning we take your parliament and we're going to deliberate trade service agreement with half a million people on the street and show you how we can do it. And this is facilitated by professional deliberators and participated by 20 NGOs of the Greens, the Labors, the, all, the, all the people uh, in the NGOs, and supported by the GovZero civic tech community. And this community is very interesting because our call to actions fork the government. We look at all the government websites that we don't like that ends in gov.tw and build a shadow website that ends in g0v.tw. So we solve this discoverability problem. You just look at a government website, change the O to a zero, and get to the shadow government with open data and everything. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> quite, quite a hack, isn't it? And also, we release under Creative Commons Zero uh, our copyright and everything, so that when the next procurement cycle comes, many of the GovZero project then become the official government websites. So that, that, that was uh, the movement. So during the Occupy, the GovZero civic tech people work as amplifiers to support the professional deliberators inside and on the streets of the occupied site so that everyone just speak naturally, but their transcripts uh, and their translations, logistics, everything is kept on the open source nervous system, just as Colin described, so that it is one of those very rare occupies that by the end of the three week, everybody converged on a set of consensus, which the member uh, of the parliament then bought in, and it was a victory instead of being more uh, diverse across time. 
But why are there literally hundreds of professionals like me who spoke to my clients at the time, and Apple and Oxford University Press, social tech saying, okay, I have to take a three week leave because the island needs me. It's, I think it's because we are the first generation, I'm 36 now, we're the first generation that enjoyed the freedom of speech after three decades of martial law and dictatorship. And it arrived in 1989 with the personal computers. So for us, the personal computer revolution and freedom of speech is the same thing. And our first presidential election in 1996 is also the popularization of the World Wide Web. And so many of us work as campaigners back then. So internet, democracy, not two things, the one and same thing in Taiwan. So when we see a free software, and we had this very long free software culture in, in movement in Taiwan, we always think of freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, instead of free of cost. Because we know that freedom is never free of cost. Our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation paid dearly for it, and we need to use the software freedoms to keep it free. I'd call all that a pretty serious game change. The rest of this video is on our website and we'll expand on what is happening there in our next show. This whole new way of thinking, one that converges on a shared world emerging from collective creativity instead of battling to force the will of some upon the rest. The way that crowdsourcing and open source and forking and merging and combining the gifts and visions of anarchists and electeds and citizens and the private sector, wow. For me, beyond any of the particulars is the realization that those who own the future are already here remaking it in ways I could not have dreamed of, using tools so new they've never before been seen on this planet. A different world is suddenly here, one that cracks open so many new possibilities and invites so many new ways of being that I am now certain that we cannot ever, ever, ever again be justified in saying, Game over.